A crow perches on a withered tree, enjoying the moonlight. Nearby, a group of people from the ancestral clan gathers at a small shack. A person wearing a fox mask explains that bamboo is believed to attract in spirits. They begin chanting something, as the green bamboo attracts these spirits and the blue lantern guides them. Today is the annual ceremony in Rongli Station, Chinja Village. For men who are descendants of the Yuchin village, bow down. The ancestors of this village have worshipped a deity for generations, and now it's time for the descendants to receive blessings. After tonight, if they can sense the yin and yang, they'll be able to distinguish between ghosts and evil spirits. When their time comes, they will accept their fate and pass away, only to be reincarnated again. At this moment, the snake fairy will bless them, and this blessing will accompany them until the end of their lives. In the next scene, in Shanghai, a young man expresses gratitude to someone for helping him move in. He looks up at the sky, hoping to find clues that will help lift a curse this time. Currently, in the middle of the night, in the city community, cold air blows into a young lady's room as she sleeps soundly. Suddenly, her door slowly opens, and a red footprint appears. It slowly moves across the walls and ceiling until it stops right above her. A weak, dark aura is directed at her. The next morning, she wakes up in her black nightgown and stretches. When she looks up, she is startled and screams. Later on, a detective is seen taking pictures of the incident. The detective asks his subordinate if they have checked the surveillance cameras of the community. However, after checking, they find no suspicious person, ruling out the possibility of someone breaking in through the door. The detective is puzzled by the red stains on the ground, and samples have been taken for testing. It turns out that the stains are human, ruling out the possibility of it being a prank. The detective wonders if the house is haunted. The victim, his reporter, ran Rue. She works as a white-collar worker in the design company. An officer seeing her state offers her hot water. She takes it and thanks him. He asked if she knows anything more about the footprints. She reveals she discovered something wasn't right about the house half a month ago. Before there were strange footsteps coming from the living room every night after it hit midnight, she didn't take it seriously. But then the sounds became clearer and clearer. She got really scared. The surveillance cameras in the apartment showed the footprints appearing out of thin air. She grabs a hold of the officer, exclaiming that there's definitely something in the house that's coming for her. The officer calls her name, asking her to calm down. The detective asked Wong if he has any plans for the night. Wong replies no. The detective tells them to calm down and suggests spending the night there. He wants to see the cause of the footprints. He tells the lady that this will make her feel more at ease. She shakes her head grateful for the help. That night officer Wong falls asleep, and the detective hangs up a call. Wong wakes up and asks if it was his sister-in-law that called him. The detective corrects him saying it was consultant Wong, who called and inquired about the specific details. The officer seems confused about a consultant. The detective takes a sit and apologizes because they often receive cases with nefarious roots. These kinds of cases are not easy to handle with the normal criminal investigation technique, so a professional is needed. Unfortunately for them, they are being watched by a dark entity. The detective notices the footsteps getting closer to them. He whispers to the officer to be quiet. There's a ghost in the house. It steps on the table. The detective informs the officer that the ghost is hooked in him. He shouldn't pant. It then brings its attention to the detective before turning around, leaving traces of its presence behind. Detective orders the officer to wake up the girl. The officer does as told frantically telling her to wake up in a low tone. Drowsy, she asks what's wrong. He informs her that they saw a ghost. She's shocked. They guide her out, but she's obviously shaken. She turns her head and is frightened. A levitating knife is pointed right towards them. It flies right towards her. Officer Wong attempts to shield her with his body, but luckily the detective intervene. He tells the officer. He'll stay and hold it off, Officer Wong exclaims, but the detective exclaims just go. It's the perfect way for him to go out like a badass. Hearing the detective words, the officer says I see and runs off with the girl. The detective tells it to not even think about it. But just then, the ghost, using more force, injures the detective. As they run down the hall, he tells the girl to take the elevator, not the stairs. The detective is unconscious on the floor as the knife chases its victim. The officer presses the button repeatedly, obviously desperate. 
It finally opens, but the officer decides to flex his muscles to make it open faster, as if that will help. Like a gentleman, he tells her to go in first, who said chivalry is dead. However, the knife is a foot away from getting them. The girl mutters, It's too late. It's too late. It closes and they sigh in relief. Suddenly, the knife pierces through the elevator door. They can't believe their eyes. It slowly opens the elevator. The knife inches closer to her until all she can see is that red knife in the next scene. We see a plane. A young girl is shown in a hat and glasses. She spots Officer Wong with a sign saying, Consultant Wong and Advisor Wong Yen Yen. She approaches him and inquires about Uncle Lee's whereabouts. The officer is confused. She informs him that she is Wang Yen Yen and her grandfather is unable to come. So it's just her. Later on, she enters Uncle Lee's hospital room. He questions where the old man is and why he didn't come. She sticks a talisman on his head. Officer Wang questions what she's doing. She crosses her fingers, stating, All evil should be avoided. And she promises not to disturb them. The talisman falls off, and she exclaims, Uncle Lee, you have no idea. Officer Wong informs her that he was stabbed by that thing. Uncle Lee confesses that the only reason he survived is thanks to her grandfather. The amulet he gave him helps him ward off disasters. As soon as the amulet burned up, the ghost ran away. Otherwise, she wouldn't be able to see him. However, judging by the amulet, the opponent shouldn't be very strong. We then see her examining the footprints. Officer Wong inquires if she's seen anything. She exclaims that the ghost in the room is a female ghost. Officer Wong thinks about a female ghost exiting a grave. She's the kind of person who's been written off by others and has a bad temper. The question remains, is it still in the room now? Unfortunately, she doesn't know unless she stays there for one night. So she will sleep in the bedroom and he will sleep in the living room. That night, Officer Wong sits on the couch playing games. He then hears a sound, like the sound of footsteps. He remembers that she had told him if the footprints appeared again, he must wake her up. But if he only hears footsteps and no footprints, there's no need to worry. The next day, she wakes up refreshed, and Officer Wong looks like an emo kid with eyeliner. She questions if he heard any footsteps. He said yes, but only for a while. By the time he reacted, the sound had already stopped. She explains that they are lucky that the supernatural beings in the house are the self-resetting type. There are many types of supernatural beings. After some beings get rid of their victims, the process resets. This type of supernatural being is relatively dull and easy to deal with, so if left alone, the sounds will get louder and louder until the footprints appear. She asks which footprint appeared first. He tells her he'll guide her to it. She crouches down, examining it, then traces its steps. He questions what she's doing. With her heel, she signals for him to go to the end. She takes out a marker and writes an X, telling him to dig it up. Later on, they break down the wall, revealing a person who passed away a long time ago. The officer brings her breakfast. He asks how she knew where the body was. She reveals that the first pair of footprints were incomplete. Also. Based on the characteristics of these spiritual guides, who are generally inflexible and will not deliberately go too far, it was very likely that the source of the footprints was in the wall. The identity of the mummy has been found. Her name is Shirka. She once worked as a shopping guide in a large shopping mall three kilometers away. Her employer said she disappeared five months ago. In addition, the deceased was the previous owner of the building. She's contacted the landlord, but the tenant information does not match. The owner of the household had rented the house long-term to a man from another province, who works at a local noodle shop to the noodle shop. The officers arrive. The chef glances behind him and sees them, then immediately makes a run for it. On his way, he almost falls on his face, but he regains his balance, and the chase begins. Yen Yen stays in the room and places the amulet on her forehead. She sees a dark aura in the room, a smell which means one or two people have passed away there. She calls Officer Wong who has caught the accused. She tells him she's still in the kitchen. She notifies him to take his time, 
and he might as well ask Chu Chu how many houses he has lived in the city. The forensic team investigates the kitchen, and the things they find are too disturbing to describe. Officer Wang vomits from the site. Yen Yen offers him a cloth. He wipes his face and asks if she's not afraid. She says maybe it's because she saw it too much as a kid. With a shocked expression, he inquires if she saw it too much when she was a kid. She explains that when she was young, her grandfather would bring her to a butcher in every town. So she's not afraid of this sight. She then inquires how many houses Chu Chu rented. In a cold tone, he informs her it's still under review, but it should be available by tomorrow morning I in the next scene. A similar event occurs. Red footprints appear on the ground, and a knife levitates toward its victim. It lunges toward the man's neck. Suddenly, the man is hit by the sun's bright rays. The driver states that the man has a lot of luggage and offers to help him carry it in. The guy realizes he's traveled back a day earlier as he's seeing the same driver as before. He's deep in thought as the driver calls out to him. He states if it's not a problem for him, it's fine. He contemplates, realizing it's impossible for him to travel back in time without keeping his memories, which means he was attacked while asleep. Since he has memory of falling asleep, he's sure that's when it happened. It's hard to believe that after receiving the blessing of the snake god, he has already utilized its power. He plans to live a peaceful life before going on the hunt for supernatural beings, but nothing ever goes as planned. He'll have to work overtime. Late that night, he was busy on his laptop when he suddenly noticed human footprints. Quickly deciphering that it was the cause of his passing last night, he gets up in an attempt to communicate with it. He introduces himself as the new tenant and clarifies that they are now neighbors. Suddenly, the ghost turns around. He thinks that despite the fact that it ignored him, it didn't try to get rid of him immediately so maybe they can live in peace. Suddenly, a butcher knife appears from behind the door. He is taken aback as the ghost went to the kitchen for a weapon to get rid of him. Panting and sweating, he arrives at the beginning once again. The driver comments on his pale complexion and inquires if he's suffering from heatstroke. The driver offers to help him move in, and he gladly accepts. Based on his experience in the second week, he realized that the ghost took the knife and hacked him until he was no longer among the living. The information that has been verified is that the ghost is very dangerous, it attacks people at every turn, and it refuses to communicate. He decides to put away all the weapons and talk with it again. Later that night, he approaches the ghost, informing it there's no use searching for the knife because he has hidden it, so they can have a nice long chat but he forgot about the frying pan which is quickly used against him. He regresses back in time. He ponders if there's something wrong with the ghost. The taxi driver asks the same question, and he happily accepts a man informs him that the situation he mentions overlaps with the Hakka legend of the living and the dead living together in the same house. However, it is almost impossible for a ghost to attack living people who have just moved in if they have sovereignty. If the ghost does not want to share the house with the living, the only thing they can do is play pranks. He understands and thanks Teacher Zhou. After the conversation, he understands that the ghost wants to drive him away. As the ghost goes for the weapons, nothing is there. The lights are suddenly turned on. He holds the pan in his hand and reveals he has already hidden the knife. He explains if it doesn't want to be his roommate, he can move out. There is no response for a while. Then suddenly the ghost grabs the microwave. He runs down the stairs, exclaiming that he'll move out, so there's no reason to get rid of him. At that moment, the microwave is hurled towards him. Everything then resets tells the taxi driver he will put in his luggage on his own. The ghost doesn't refuse to stay in the same room with others, it just attacks whoever moves in. The wisest choice would be to move out or change the residence before it gets dark. However, he can't leave this mess alone. If he leaves, the next renter will be in danger. He has the protection of the snake god, so he cannot die so easily. But one thing doesn't make sense. If the ghost was like this in the past, the house should be considered a haunted house that can kill people, and it should be banned from renting he takes out his phone to call the renter. The renter denies anything being wrong with the house. He questions if he's an expert in that field and should tell him what's wrong with his house. 
The renter is then asked if the last tenant heard strange noises accompanied by red footprints at night. The renter verifies this. He then tells the renter he'll contact him after verifying things. He holds his head, thinking how unlucky he is. The previous renter went through the same thing. She moved out, then he moved in. He decides to contact Zhou about the matter again. Bijou questions if he wants to know the story of the living and the dead living in the same house. He confirms this, saying he wants to write a novel around it. Zhou inquires if he wants to know the Hakka custom of housewarming or the Zhao people's view of house and gods. The young man states that he wants to know about all of it. Zhou explains that all that is needed is to move the charcoal burned in the old house into the new one. Rong's family believes the world is filled with lonely ghosts that cannot be seen by ordinary humans. Ghosts don't like sun, rain, or wind, so they must stay in a house. If a house is vacant for a long time, it's inevitable that it will be occupied by a ghost. He thanks Zhou but, before hanging up, requests precautions and the process of relocating family members with the help of the stove god. He buys talisman paper, hair, and a brazier for connecting the stove. Back home, he looks at the clock. It's almost time to get started. He lights the talisman and places it in the coal pot, chanting something as it burns. Suddenly, he hears screaming and has no choice but to cover his ears. He ponders if the wall is being cut next door or if the kitchen god is fighting the evil spirit in the house. Footprints appear on the wall, forming a human figure. He thinks the kitchen god is warning him that the danger is mainly concentrated in the walls. Suddenly, the ceiling is covered with footprints and handprints. It's as if the kitchen god is in a fierce battle with the evil spirit, which has never happened before. At that moment, red substance falls from the ceiling, covering his body. He realizes something is wrong. He cannot move. The things he had lit were put out by the fire. As he's frozen in place, he's stunned to see a human figure covered by the red substance. He realizes that the footprints are traces of the evil spirit, not its actual body. The evil spirit smiles and leans closer to his face, grabbing his neck. He then finds himself back at the starting point, remembers what the stove lord had shown him and takes out a hammer. It should be in the wall. With one swing of the hammer, he smashes the wall and covers his nose. The smell is unbearable. But he finds what he's looking for. Meanwhile, Li Daji is being interrogated. Yen Yen and Officer Wang watch him from behind the glass. Yen Yen comments that it seems he doesn't want to talk. Officer Wang clarifies there's no need for him to talk until the colleague responsible for checking the account balance in his name comes back. Then they'll find out how many people he has gotten rid of over the years. A female officer informs them that someone has dug up remains in their ancestral house. Scene of the incident. The man is eating noodles, and Yen Yen questions how he knows there were remains in the wall. He asks if she wants to play police, but before that, she must wait for him to finish eating. She goes to speak with Officer Wong for a moment. Officer Wong sits next to him and tells him they should talk about it and not try to fool him with stuff like mold growing on the wall or the wall being uneven. The suspect is very sophisticated, and the apartment has had several rounds of tenants. Those tenants didn't notice anything, and they lived there for so long, but he noticed upon moving in. Also, they need a reasonable explanation for why he chose this problematic house to move into. Feng Hui tells them they're overthinking it. It was just a coincidence. Officer Wang and Yen Yen look at one another, then turn to Feng Hui, saying they don't believe him. Feng Hui explains when he moves, he goes through the process of housewarming. Yen Yen exclaims it's a process the older generation uses, including her grandpa. They believe that the kitchen god, who kept their home safe, would help drive away ghosts from their home. As a result, Elders would often hold extravagant housewarming ceremonies to welcome the stove lord. Officer Wang inquires if that's how he figured it out. Feng Hui says he's right, but he'll never guess what he saw. Yen Yen believes he's deceiving outsiders. Excessive relocation is quite effective when getting rid of wild ghosts, but the target must also be divided. If it's an evil ghost, it will cause damage to the earth body. If he has the means to do as he claims, she will stand on her head to wash it from now on, Hui explains. A figure watches them from a rooftop. He's covered in bandages. 
The bandaged man gets a call. The person on the call asks what's wrong. He responds that there's been a disruption. The person tells him to get rid of it, but only after receiving Li Daji Peking's ghost. Meanwhile, Officer Wang informs Feng Hui that according to their rules, the person who reports the crime must come to the station to make a record. Feng Hui responds no problem. He'll cooperate. Suddenly, dirty bandages enter the room through the balcony. They join together, forming legs until they form a body. He decides to recover the evil spirit in the house before doing anything else. He grips his chest. Then a light emanates from it until a box is seen. He places it on the ground and removes its cover, looking at the hole in the wall. He tells the evil ghost to walk in. We then see red footprints inside the box. He closes the box and comments, Three more to go. Meanwhile, on their way to the police station, Yen Yen asks why he lied. She states that his explanation may fool a normal person, but it won't fool her. Moving too far will only affect lonely ghosts. It doesn't affect serious ghosts. It will not only have no effect but will also cause serious trouble. Since he found out there was something wrong with the house only a bit after moving in, that means he has some way of protecting himself or he wouldn't have been able to make the report. Feng Hui smiles and tells her it's expected to be curious about how he survived. However, he made it clear he didn't know it was haunted in the interrogation room. The suspect is very relaxed, but the officers seem frustrated. One of the officers leaves to relieve some tension. At that moment, Officer Wang arrives and inquires if the suspect has started talking. The officer states the guy knows that he's been caught, but if it wasn't for the regulations, he would punch him a few times. Officer Wang tells him they can't afford to be punished for that type of behavior. Feng Hui inquires who's inside. She explains that he's the one who buried the person inside the wall he rented. Looking at how calm he is, it's difficult to find out how many rental houses are like the one he rented. If other houses are occupied by evil spirits, more people's lives will be endangered. So if he has any tips, she would really love to hear them. He reminds her that it was an accident he ended up in the house. Officer Wang tells Xiao they should switch places. He takes the witness report from Feng Hui, and he and Yen Yen will interrogate the suspect. Feng Hui walks away with the officer. A family is watching television. They receive a knock on the door, and the father goes to answer it. He looks through the peephole, but no one's there. He thinks it's a prank from a kid. Suddenly, the knocking starts again. He quickly opens the door, but is surprised that no one's there. Suddenly, the bandaged man passes right through him and approaches the wall, noticing that the evil spirit woke up a long time ago. He inquires why the family is still alive and asks if the ghost has gone soft. Suddenly, red footprints appear on the wall. The mom calls for her husband, who yells, Take the kid away! The daughter then cries, Dad has passed away! Officer Wong takes a seat and informs the suspect that they'll catch him now. The suspect inquires if there's no one at the Shanghai Police Department for them to bring a girl with a pay that has yet to be grown. Yen Yen then questions where he learned his ghost hunting skills. He's silent for a moment before saying he doesn't know what she's talking about. She replies if he doesn't want to admit it, they can treat it like small talk. There are certain requirements needed for a ghost to be born. Suitable time, suitable place, and the deceased before dying must have great regret. However, even if all the conditions are met, a person won't turn into a ghost so easily or may not turn at all. One case might be accidental, but there are already two cases where they've found evil spirits existing in the form of red footprints. He nonchalantly comments that she has watched too many movies. His eyes then open wide, seeing a ghost right behind Yen Yen. She comments that it seems he can see it. He states, See what? Aren't we the only ones here? She responds that it doesn't matter. Ghosts don't exist. So there's nothing they can do about what happens next. As the ghost gets closer, he begins to sweat and avert his gaze. He screams, exclaiming, Get away! She then says it would have been better to cooperate like that before. Officer Wang asks who taught him about the ghost. He responds no one can control the magic of ghosts, but someone told him if he does this, he'll never see ghosts again. In the past, he was under a bridge shaking and sweating. No matter where he looked, 
there were ghosts. Suddenly, a voice appears, pitying him for gaining the ability to see ghosts only after becoming an adult. The bandaged man says if he's scared to see the dead, then he can try his method, which he assures him that he won't run into ghosts again. At that moment, the bandaged man gets a feeling that Lee is telling people about him. The bandaged man comments that he dares to bite the hand that feeds him, but he's busy now, so he'll deal with him later. Feng Hui asks if there's been any progress in the case. Yen Yen says there are already clues about the mastermind behind the scene. At that moment, the bandaged man enters the department, and everyone stares at him. He begins to remove boxes from his body. An officer approaches him and comments that he shouldn't wear fancy clothes there. The bandage man then says, Get rid of everyone inside the building. The officer falls to the ground, and everyone starts running. Feng Hui and the others hear the screaming. Yen Yen defensively places a hand in front of Feng Hui and tells them they should investigate. When they arrive downstairs, there are only unconscious people and evil spirits. Seeing that the bandage man is there, Yen Yen ponders if he's the man Li was talking about. The bandage man states he was planning to come to them, but he supposes they took the initiative and came to him. Officer Wang takes out his weapon and tells him to let them go or else he'll shoot. The bandage man calls it a meaningless threat. Officer Wang states he's not kidding. Officer Wang shoots, but it's his first time seeing such an arrogant gangster. However, the bullets pass right through him. Yen Yen intervenes and takes out her talisman. The bandage man asks if he gave her permission to move, and a purple aura holds her in place. She ponders how there could be a ghost who has accomplished piety. Officer Wong is surprised that the supernatural expert they hired couldn't even go face to face against the bandage man. Feng Hui wonders who the bandage man is. As the evil spirit approaches them, Feng Hui realizes that he must go back again. Feng Hui sits on his couch deep in thought, considering the relationship between the bandage man and the ghost. Since the person who hid them in the walls was captured, as the mastermind he cannot sit and do nothing. He suddenly realizes that the bandage man came with Yen Yen and Officer Wang after he called the police. Feng Hui is then seen on the couch and asks Yen Yen if she's the supernatural consultant. Feng Hui extends his hand to her. She stares at Officer Wang for a moment, then shakes Feng Hui's hand. He states that as a paranormal consultant, she rushed there as soon as he reported the case, which means she already knows about the existence of the Red Ghost. Officer Wong questions what he means by Red Ghost. He explains that the ghost is invisible, but under normal circumstances, you can see the ghost. Yen Yen exclaims, Physical break? She questions if he's sure. He states, Of course but he hasn't had time to investigate if the ghost in the rental apartment has reached the red ghost level. She questions how he can be sure that the ghost is related to the red ghost he mentioned. He's seen this kind of magic before and only followed the clues there to arrive at the apartment. Also, the ghosts appear in groups so there should be four more. Officer Wong inquires what now. She explains that if what he says is true, there's a magician who can stun and create red ghosts. Unfortunately. This is beyond her abilities. The bandage man wonders why this guy knows so much. Judging by his appearance, he's encountered the Four Ghost Gate ceiling formation in other cities. He wonders if Lee passed on the Four Ghost ceiling formation to others. The bandage man calls someone and informs him that Lee has leaked information about the Four Ghost ceiling formation and that someone came from far away to check on them. The man on the other end says although lies and betrayal are human nature, Betrayal is betrayal, so the traitor must pay. Officer Wang questions Yen Yen about whether she believes Feng Hui. She says that, assuming they've caught the actual criminal, yes. She explains it's easy to find out who's behind the incident, but she's worried this is only the tip of the iceberg. The more they investigate, the more interesting things will become. Also, she's never heard of a magician who can make many red ghosts stably and easily. Not even her grandfather is capable of that. Feng Hui then realizes they've forgotten to bring him to the police station to make a report. But that's okay because with the blessing of the snake god, he can't participate in their high-end games without mastering supernatural means. He just doesn't know if they'll take the information he's given them seriously. Suddenly, he notices the bandage man in his room. 
He's surprised, wondering why the bandage man is there. The bandage man comments that it's surprising, but it seems he knows what he looks like. His face becomes pale as he wonders what caused the problem. He hadn't told Wang or Yen Yen anything about him. The bandage man holds out his hand, and a dark energy emits from it. Suddenly, Feng Hui begins to fall asleep. After a while, he wakes up in a torture chamber. With a scary smile, the bandage man comments that he's awake. Walking closer, he asks if it was Li Daji who told him what he looked like. Feng Hui questions who that is. Feng Hui quickly realizes it's over. He's been caught by this lunatic who turned the police station red. He then realizes if the time exceeds 24 hours, he will be trapped and returned to the torture room even after death. The bandage man removes his pinky. He screams in pain but realizes he can't take the risk. He must end it and go back in time. Feng Hui immediately ends his suffering with a smile. The bandage man is astonished. He calls someone to inform them of Feng Hui's passing. In the next scene, Feng Hui waits outside a building. Officer Wang inquires if he was the one who reported the crime. He then looks at Yen Yen and comments that she's a mysterious person from Electric City at such a young age. While slightly blushing, she questions if he knows about paranormal consultants and if he's in the paranormal community. He nervously states he also works as a paranormal consultant for a period of time and invites them to go upstairs. An officer informs them that, according to Feng Hui's request, pinhole cameras have been installed in the living room. Feng Hui thinks with the cameras, he'll be able to see how the bandage man appeared. Officer Wang inquires if he can tell them how he found the mummy inside the wall. Feng Hui responds, of course. He explains he came to Shanghai following clues from other cases and discovered the rental house purely by accident. He didn't imagine that if he moved too far, the evil spirit would have such a reaction. The mummy was discovered by him when he was lighting the fire. Officer Wang inquires if there's anything wrong with his statement. Yen Yen responds that logically everything is legitimate. Feng Hui takes out a paper, telling her this is the person he's looking for. As far as he knows, the man in the sketch is dangerous. Many ordinary people embark on the path of ending lives and suppressing ghosts under his influence. She asks for more details, believing their cases may be connected. The bandage man informs the person on the phone that he was exposed, and someone provided the police with his information. Meanwhile, Li Daji has his legs on the table. An officer tells him to put his legs down. Li begins to whistle, ignoring him. Xiao gets up and screams if he heard him. Officer Wang enters and orders that they switch places. Li mockingly states if there's no one in the police department. He requests a young female frog for help. She takes out the sketch which catches Li off guard. She inquires if he knows the person. Outside the interrogation room, Feng Hui remembers that not long after they finished interrogating Li, the bandage man will appear. Then he can leave while they're fighting and return home to confirm his theory. Officer Wang and Yen Yen exit the room. He inquires if the investigation is over. Because of the materials he provided, the suspect has confessed locations of many bodies and the location of a burial ground. Feng Hui states the case they were investigating is the same. Yen Yen states they were colleagues before they even knew we then see Yen Yen lifeless. The bandage man is puzzled for a moment then realizes that Feng Hui didn't come down. We then see Feng Hui at home investigating the footage. After they left, the bandage man sneaked into the house. Their judgment was wrong. The ghost was not freed but still trapped in the wall. He closes the laptop and thinks about the bandage man's method of recovering the evil ghost. Suddenly, he notices the bandage man. The bandage man had a hard time finding him. Feng Hui realizes that he won in the end, even with the intelligence he provided. Yen Yen was no match. The bandage man licks his finger, which looks kinda hot if you don't look at the face. Back to the story, he says he'll repay Feng Hui for the trouble he caused a hundred times over. Feng Hui immediately ends it. He's not in the mood to play a torture game with him. He teleports next to the cab guy, who, noticing his appearance, inquires if he needs to go to the hospital. Feng Hui tells him it's an old problem and requests help to go to the nearest funeral store so that he can buy an urn. We then see him revealing everything to the two. 
Officer Wang is having a hard time understanding everything and needs a moment to sort it out. Yen Yen states that regardless of whether there's an evil mastermind behind the scenes, how does he know so much? And can he prove that the evil ghost he's talking about is still in the room? He states he knows this because similar cases have happened in other cities and he has been following the clues. As for the ghost, he'll prove it now. He stands in front of the hole, taking a deep breath. He hopes there are no other strings attached to the containment process. He places the box in front of the hole, removes the lid, and stands to the side. Officer Wang comments that nothing happened. Yen Yen corrects him, saying the evil spirit was still in the room. Officer Wang is shocked to see the red footprints entering the box. Feng Hui quickly closes the box and states that there are three more ghosts like this in the city, considering they've captured the mastermind. It's a good idea to hurry up, as the other person may start recovering the evil spirits, Feng Hui said. The bandage man exclaimed, No! Where did that kid get the ghost sealing formation method? They barged into the interrogation room. Li was full of himself as usual. Yen Yen then dropped the box on the table. She told him they had no time to waste. She showed him the sketch and gave him three minutes to talk, to explain his relationship with the bandage man and where he buried the bodies. Li pondered how they knew, then exclaimed he didn't know what they were talking about. Yen Yen smirked, and the old ghost behind her did the same. They'd found the location of the burials. The task was now half complete. All that was left was to find the bandage man's weaknesses and prepare for battle. Feng Hui stated that after the bandage man used peach wood to control Li Gui, he asked if they could do the same and attack him with them. Yen Yen explained there was no need for that since, without the use of ghosts, a warlock's power is greatly weakened. The bandage man commented he was causing a lot of trouble, catching their attention. He pointed at Feng Hui and explained that, because of his mouth, he was scolded badly by his boss. Ignoring him, Feng Hui told them not to get distracted because the bandage man had some supernatural means to instantly stop them from moving. If they fell for it, it would be all over. The bandage man, Shocked that Feng Hui even knew this, dropped the boxes, releasing the ghosts. He commented, If I didn't know it was impossible, I would think there was a mole among us. Yen Yen took out talismans from her pocket and threw them at the bandage man. The talismans turned into beasts, which bit him. However, he began to unravel, and they were shocked that he was empty inside. Yen Yen pondered if the bandage man was human or ghost. Officer Wang reminded her that two more red ghosts were coming at them. She threw another talisman at them, which turned into a flying rooster, making the ghosts disappear. Meanwhile, the bandages were in a heated fight with the talismans. After subduing the talismans, he destroyed them in one blow. His bandages began to reattach as he exclaimed her method was paper cutting. At that moment, the bandage man attacked. He was able to capture Yen Yen. She was caught by some transparent things that looked like bandages. They were not very fast, and it was not difficult to spot them if you paid close attention he needed to make more preparations.